Welcome to Activate Africa, an Oak Post TV production. My name is Obonia Agomeze. We tell stories of the positive things that Africans are doing all over the continent. Things that are extraordinary, things that are unique, things that are exceptional. By the way, this is the pilot episode of this show. And I had the unique opportunity of visiting Ebony State, where the governor engineer, Dr. Dave Omai, is transforming the state one project at a time. When I did this thing, I said that this, I drew it. Okay, and if it's changing, I should know. We see his projects in road construction, civil infrastructure, education, healthcare, things that can only be in the imagination of people that will make you ask the question, are Africans really doing these kind of things? By the way, we also had the opportunity of dining with the governor. He had the opportunity of sharing some unique stories with us, but it's an exclusive story. I, I, there's no way I could share some of that information. So, but join me as we dive deep into the mind of the governor as we see some of the information and the messages that he had on how he is activating the minds of Ebonians. And we will see this in the press conference that we had. Let's go into it. Welcome to Activate Africa, an Oak Post TV production. His Excellency, Governor Dave Umai, is a man with vision and mission to achieve extraordinary things. What is the foundation of this pursuit for excellence? I can say God is the foundation. Uh, I know very well that we came on board in an unusual uh, manner. The faith I confess says that by the fear of God, you know, men depart from evil. Uh, one is, you know, fear of God. When God gives you assignment, when God calls you and gives you assignment. And I think that the plight of a born state was a major concern to God Almighty. Because before we came on board, uh, of course, former administrators them did their best, and the two uh, former civilian governors also did their best. Uh, it's like the late foundation. Uh, but even at that, we were still being very much uh, Nobody uh, uh, regarded anybody from a boy state or the state itself. Of course, we thank Abacha uh, for creating a boy state uh, in 1996. And, uh, of course, we also thank the Founding Fathers. And that, that gave us some measure of uh, freedom and a platform to aspire. And so when the foundation, you know, uh, was laid by the uh, previous uh, administrators and the civilian governors, it was just the beginning of uh, 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 a journey. And when we came on board, we were still being called the dust of the nation. But we had clear vision of what God wanted us to do. And uh, I know God doesn't call any man that has nothing to offer. Each time God calls people, God called them based on something. And so I was a party chairman for four years. I was deputy governor for years. And uh, those years were enough for me to have learned, you know, the problems of our people, uh, what the people uh, needed most and how to, you know, rewrite uh, the history of a born state. And so I can say that on that Chief Martin Elegy, I went to school to understudy, you know, how to lift up the state. And I'm very happy that I did because it was, you know, a divine call by God Almighty. And so these uh, are the inspirations and uh, uh, that, that, that are the driving, you know, uh, a force that has propelled us. The, the truth is that, uh, you know, God equipped 
you know, in a, in a very unusual manner. Um, my training, uh, secondary school, uh, Government College Afibu, a very disciplined uh, school. So, and um, I was an excellent student, in, especially in science subjects, you know, an alpha student in science subjects. And then I went to another school, uh, uh, the first uh, university of technology in the country, which is uh, in Enugu, who were the foundational, uh, you know, uh, students there. And so I got, you know, I studied under a very severe and disciplined environment and uh, graduated after five years and served, you know, with Saipem uh, uh, in uh, Igbin Lagos gas pipeline. As young as I was, I was uh, made a head, the only black man that was heading the cathodic protection, you know, section among several other white people, you know, that, you know, were there. And then my uh, fear of God in my family background, uh, my mother was a near saint, and so my father and uh, all members of our family are very... We hate corruption, we hate cheating people, uh, and so that is, you know, one training. The, another training is, um, you know, the, the, since I graduated, uh, I've been uh, either working in partnership, you know, with uh, other companies, or working for myself. So all my life I've been in the field. You know, I'm a man of the field. I've acquired a lot of experience, you know, working with expatriates, uh, be it Saipan, uh, you know, SCP uh, from uh, Israel, be it the Germans, be it the Italians. I've worked with a lot of expatriates. And one thing I've found out is that the driving force and the, the major reason for their success is discipline, you know, commitment. The time to play, you play. The time to work, you work. And so, being equipped with all this, you know, I do design, I do construction, and they give me a lot of joy. So, I've been unusually equipped by God to do this job. And uh, having been trained by, you know, uh, Chief Elechi, you know, who is a very good administrator, uh, was a commissioner in the old central state, and of course, the immediate past governor of the state. So, I worked under him as party chairman, I worked under him as a deputy governor, so I think in terms of administration, apart from managing my businesses, uh, the, I can say that I've got you know, a lot of uh, you know, training under a man that is well, uh, very vast in administration. And then my technical experience, my fear of God, and my commitment and determination that a boy instead must rise and speak when other states are speaking, and even speak before other states will speak. And so this is the vision, and uh, this is what is driving us. I, I'm very happy today that in many sectors of uh, infrastructure, we are speaking ahead of other states. It doesn't matter how much you know, we are getting. What is important is the commitment to the people. I love my people, I love God, and I want to rewrite the history. What I think is the most you know, uh, accomplished achievement is the number of people I brought out of poverty, the number of people I turned away from politics to being engineers, businessmen, and women, the number of uh, people that, uh, you know, uh, been able to build their houses, you know, ride brand new vehicles. Uh, the number of people that are no longer ashamed to say that from a Bonny State. Uh, uh, for me, these are the legacies I think that, uh, you know, we have achieved and uh, it's very unique. Because when you build the people, they will build the nation. That's what I believe. What would you say is the catalyst for this transformation? The Word of God is the, is the catalyst, you know, a catalyst is something that has the capacity to change something and still remains on his own. So I think that, you know, the uh, determination to rewrite, you know, uh, I wouldn't like to be in a place, you know, where people will talk down on my state, you know, we talk down on my people. I wouldn't like that because uh, I competed very well in all my schools, you know. Uh, uh, if I didn't come first, I would come second. So why would I, in the society of Nigeria, you know, because, um, you know, Abonyi was poor, you know, we are being talked down. So I said, no, I have to change the history. We have to talk when others are talking. And when they are not even talking, we should talk. And so God's calling 
And I want to say this to the society. When people criticize leaders, it means that they don't understand the word of God. Good leaders come from God and bad leaders come from God. And so people need to be grateful when they have good leaders, you know, because God is using it to bless the people. It's God that also sends bad leaders to punish the people. He does that. And if you doubt it, you go and look at the Bible. That's what the Bible says. You know, so, you know, uh, I think that God is merciful, you know, to a born state. And that's why you see all these things going on. I cannot take credit for them, you know. Most of them, God, you know, uh, gives us the vision, even while I sleep. And uh, we pray about it, and you see these things working. And uh, we ask God for destiny helpers. And then you see help coming everywhere in terms of, uh, you know, the human resources. And then we begin to manage our resources. And uh, the management of our finances is another school altogether. Uh, 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 maybe if you ask me, I'll let you know how. How? Um, I'm an engineer, and I'm a practical engineer. I'm a field engineer. So um, if the ministries come up, uh, the design, I partake in the design. I partake in the formulation of the vision, and then I'll now give it to them. So uh, when the design is done, I give it to them to formulate the bill of quantities. There's what we call direct labor work. And the direct labor work has the elements of empowerment inside this, which means that if you do this work, you know, correctly, you know, using the local people, and of course under my watch, there is no project in this state that I do not visit at least twice a week. And then of course also being helped by, you know, professional engineers. So this element of doing this job excellently well, as any expatriate would do it, there's ex ex you know, an aspect of it, you know, that is, you know, the people you make, you know, some profit, you know, about 10%, you know, which expatriates would have made maybe 50, 60%. So for me, it's empowerment. Again, the money, you know, stays within a bony state. And again, the women, the men, the boys, you know, they engage in this work, you know. So you can say that 99.9% .9 of our money are circulating within. How do we achieve this? When something comes to me, I sit down to make the calculation. I check the calculation, the bills. I know the rates, you know. There's no element of construction item you ask me now that I will not tell you this is the cost, be it, you know, cost of concrete per meter cubed. And the, I can disaggregate the, the concrete to say this is the cost of cement, how many cement we use for grade 15, for grade 20, for grade 25, for grade 40, and what is it all used. There are different grades for different structures. I have always said that we need to check the cost of our construction. We need to check the cost of our infrastructure. If you're Mr. President and you don't have all the knowledge of the technicalities, especially now we are borrowing to fund infrastructure, the tendency is that you depend, you know, on the mercy of those working with you. I'm not saying those working with you cannot be trusted, but I've gone, gotten experience here. I have not accepted everything my technical commissioner submit to me. I make my own impute to bring down the cost, and it has always worked. So I think that the character of the president Nigeria needs now is a man with a combination of a number of factors, not just a politician. Like the water structure is a different grade, the bridge structure for different grades, the road different grades. And so God has endowed me with this experience. And so I put them down, and then I know the cost. You know, and the, remember there are three cost elements, or four. One is, you know, what I call empowerment, which is the profit you make. The second one is the excellent, you know, performance of the job. You know, the, the third one is uh, the taxes, you know. There is 1% education levy that is incorporated. There's 7.5%, you know, VAT, it was 5% before. And then there is uh, a 5% uh, withholding tax. So you now add 13.5%, and then you give it out. And then... I also try to engage the Dangote Cement directly. The chairman is my friend. I engage Lafarge directly. He's also my friend. So we try to buy the cement in bulk. You know, we reduce the cost of the cement, you know, by buying in bulk. So we give you the cement that is the equivalent of what you need. So the ministry will now supply the cement to them at a very reduced cost, you know. And then it is now the duty of the engineers to ensure that you use the number of bags of cement per meter cubed as required. 
and so with the rods. You know, we use TNT rods, the best quality in the country. And so, I now come, the, I do a visualization of what I'm going to get in the month of, uh, you know, March, for example. And I do that in February. And I say that in March, you know, maybe FAC, I'm going to get X, Y, Z. Maybe my GR is going to be X, Y, Z. If there is any intervention on fund, I put them together. Then I will now begin to look at the ongoing projects. How much have I paid? What is the balance? You know, so for me to give out any project to work, I must be sure when that project will finish, I must be sure how to, you know, disaggregate the funds so that every month, you know, the project will receive some funds. There is no project since I came on board 2015 has ever stopped for one day because of lack of funds. And where, even when the project is going on, I have not earned the money. I put the money saved for that particular project in what is called a sinking fund. So the fund is there, you will not touch it, but when you now walk to that level, then we have the fund already, so we take it and they pay you. It doesn't mean that by putting in sinking funds that we don't have needs. No, it's priorities, you know. And so this is what we are doing. So it's very difficult for you to jump up and say you are giving a Boeing State Governor a proposal, you know, because at every point in time, I mean, want, you know, because I spend my money in advance. And so I spend in advance, you cannot give me any tempting proposal that will make me to deviate from the priorities that we have all set you know, for ourselves. And these priorities are set before the stakeholders in terms of the projects. And we make sure there is a quality of uh, you know, sighting and performance in all the local government areas and senatorial zones. So this is the secret of what we're doing. You know, and uh, like I said, it has to be by the sincerity of the heart that you do this. It is quite tasking because you have to move from project site to project site. You know, it's not everybody that is on the same platform with you. No matter how much you preach, people will still want to cut corner. If you're supposed to use nine bags, people will still want to use seven bags. But you have equipment we also use to, to check. And if you also steal cement, and that's why I come very hard. I'm very hard when it comes to discipline, you know. And the police is my friend, the SSA is my friend. And no matter whom you are, if you do not conform to the processes, and uh, to the, the laid down rules, you're a candidate of going to visit them. If I give you money on that direct level and you don't retire it, then if you're prosecuted, you go to prison for two years without option of fine. So, and that is it. So sometimes people say, oh yes, he's doing direct labor, but he's giving the job to his company. Which company? I have a very well, you know, structured company that I started you know, uh, in, uh, in the year uh, uh, 1991. And uh, these projects have been, uh, you know, I was into OIA, I was into construction, I was into hotel management and real estate. And when I came on board, you know, as deputy governor in 2011, I made sure that my company, Brass Engineering, never did any business, either at the local government level, at the state level, at the uh, federal level, you know. And now, when you say his company is doing it, can you provide one this? And the, I beat my chest and say that all these projects are being done by the ministries and the stakeholders of the state through the ministries. But I make sure you do it. In the airport construction, it's the same story. Um, it's quite a very uh, challenging project because when we uh, were given that site, the Depth of cotton, in most cases, you know, was over 40 feet. And some filling were over 45 feet. So what I did was to calculate the volume of cotton and the volume of filling. And then I decided which level I want to be. So that every cotton and filling, you know, I don't have to go and borrow material from outside. And it was a very tough decision, you know because you have quite a lot to cut and you have quite a lot to fill. The only thing is that you will not go outside the vicinity of the airport to go and borrow material to fill. And that's what we are doing. So the most challenging work at the airport is the artwork, you know. Not to, notwithstanding the fact that we are doing over 16 inch thick concrete uh, uh, runway, uh, which is the first of its kind in Nigeria. Uh, but for me, it's not the challenging 
the most challenging aspect of the work. The most challenging aspect of the work is their work because you must have you know, a minimum of uh, about uh, you know, 500 you know, meters in about 50 either side that will be totally flat with the runway uh, for safety. So it's exactly what you're doing. What is it in the airport construction? Yes, the equipment. Equipment was uh, awarded you know, through international bidding. And we, 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 we are awarded at 7.6 billion. Uh, uh, not only that is the lowest, but is the most responsive because we've seen what the person has done. I say Nigerian, you know, wants to you, you know, his company. And then uh, that's an aspect, uh, but that's not all the equipment. We still have another five to 10 billion equipment to, to do, but this set of equipment, the airport could run without it, you know. Now, you have the tower, which is 10th floor. It's done by, you know, direct level, and it's completed. You have the terminal building, you know, which is, you know, concrete reinforcement, clay pot, you know, it's by direct level, and I can say 70% in terms of uh, the builder's work done. You have the uh, presidential lounge, you have the uh, police post, you have the fire service, you have the immigration, you have so many other buildings that are there. All of them are all done by direct labor. And of course, you can see them doing the work when you go there. Well, we already have, uh, you know, by the Bureau of Statistics of Nigeria, you know, we already have, you know, very well, you know, employment rating, you know, in a bunch of states. But uh, I think that uh, this employment is because of uh, a couple of developments we are doing like the international market. You know, but there are going to be quite a lot of employment that will be permanent. The international market, the new park we are building, the new estate we are building, the mall we have built, the uh, a communical center, the airport, the King David uh, Medical University, the first of its kind in the whole of uh, West Africa. Uh, and of course, we are starting two more new universities, uh, uh, the ICT University, and then uh, University of uh, Aeronautical Engineering. Uh, the, those two proposals are before the NUC for approval. So we're going to have quite a lot, you know. Of course, we have the three industrial clusters, you know, where we have, uh, you know, built up, you know, uh, these clusters uh, where a lot of uh, buildings and infrastructure for people to come in and set up, you know, businesses. So we believe so. Here. Um, in all of these accomplishments in the state, what would you say are some of the leadership like challenges that you had and how did you overcome them? Yeah, the most challenging uh, uh, problem I can say is the people, the people. You know, when people have lived with a particular way of life and method and you want to change it, it's difficult. You cannot do these changes without the people. They have to understand, they have to believe in you, they have to work with you. And uh, I discovered that um, uh, if you want to change you know, uh, a situation, you have two sets of uh, problems confronting you. One is the people. And then the second, those who are, you know, who, who, who have kept the people where they are, you know, those who are the initiators of the problems or the challenges. And so you have to fight both of them. You know, how do you fight the people? You have to fight them by engaging them, you know, and resisting them. That is no longer the same. The business is no longer the same. You have to engage them. You have to talk to them. You have to meet them one by one. But you also have to give in, you know. It's like a man who has taken cocaine all his life and you come and suddenly say, stop cocaine. No, you have to do, you know, withdrawal syndrome and then, you know, and engage the person. And eventually you see that the person will be on the same board with you. It cannot mechanize it. But the people that are, you know, against the people, you have to, you know, confront them frontally, you know, but also a way of engagement to say, look, shall we continue like this? What do we bequeath, you know, to our children? You know, so you have two sets of fights to do. And uh, <laughs> I did, and I'm still doing these two sets of fights. And it will continue even to the next administration. But I'm very, very much confident that we have won over 70% and that the next administration is going to totally overcome. And Your Excellency, uh, 
if given the chance to lead Nigeria, how do you, how will you continue to foster the bonds of national unity? Well, the, I believe strongly that um, you know you need to engage the people. You need to you know move from one you know region to the other, and then you need to discuss with the leaders. I've always said that the level of patriotism, you know, from we leaders, you know, to our country is not enough. In America, the American man will always say America first. And that's what we need to know. Our people need to know that this money is nothing. Because we do not know where the next bus stop will be. That what is, you know, the lasting uh, benefit why here on earth is what, you know, the legacies we will leave behind for our children. Why you are building other people's children, you are building your children. So there is a need for engagement. Some of this insecurity we hear are man-made, you know. The, the Mr. President may have all the good intention, he has always had good intention, he's a good man. And then, from the President's vision and the determination, how does it, you know, go down to the last man? Everybody must have the same vision for these things to work. So there is a need to engage the people. There is a need to discuss. Even these bandits that are, you know, here and there, there those who have volunteered to say, look, we talk, talk with these bandits, we see them, you know, we can use those people to engage. Why do we need to kill ourselves? There's, there can be no development with this level of insecurity, you know. And I can assure you that if we engage our leaders and we are sincere and we are determined to build a united Nigeria under fairness, equity, and justice, Nigeria will bounce back again. It doesn't matter the good intention of the leaders. If the led are not convinced, if the led are not cooperating, it is a very difficult tax. It's like trying to pull down the house that will come upon all of us. So engagement is highly recommended. In other words, using the carrot and stick approach? Where the stick uh, is not even there, it is you have to do the first thing first by knowing why do people do what they do. You know, why do people do what they do? And uh, you have to make sure that people around you have the same vision in sincerity with you. You know, so you have to build the, the nucleus and then make sure it radiates and then begin to preach to the people to say, look, we are happy when everybody is happy. You know, and that's the essence of life. I've also applied it in my state, you know, and uh, luckily for me, it is working. You know, so you are still can come. If this approach has failed, you will stick and come. Because I'm not saying that 100% of the bandits can repent by this engagement. But those who want war should be able to get war. And those who want to genuinely be united to the society, you know, and then have something meaningful doing, you know, they should be nothing bad in that. Because we are being brainwashed. You know, a number of these bandits enter into this not because they really want to do that. They are being brainwashed. And some of them are under hard drug. And so we must say that if these are our biological children, what do we do? You have to talk to them first. Some people have also, you know, disowned their children. How? Because they could not conform to the principles of the family, you know, ethics. We continue to recommend, you know, more engagement. And let them see the fruits of those who have repented, who have genuinely repented. These people are our people. Let us know why they went into killing us. We need to know. And then it's only when we know that we can solve the problems. And many people have gone ahead to know. Many people have been able to hold their states by this kind of engagement. But grace is not the same. But all the same. We have to engage. We have to discuss. We have to preach. We have to appeal. Don't forget that a lot of this insecurity, apart from you know, some of our people embracing it within, and a lot of them are also being funded from outside. And so there is little you can do, you know, uh, you know, in trying to diffuse the external intention of people who want to destroy this country. Kinetic approach will now definitely come. It's war, declaration of war on the nation Nigeria. And we can't fold our hands to say we are negotiating with people we do not know. So such are isolated and then decisively, you know, uh, 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 engaged. I have noted three keys that is working in your administration. You're a man of education, exposure, and experience. 
How will you replicate this in Nigeria if given the opportunity to become the president of this nation? Yeah, it's very simple. You, you see, you can't solve all the problems of Nigeria in one day. That's not possible. But like I said, you know, the, be it universities, you can pick out the best six universities, six federal and six state universities, and make them the examples of what university ought to be. And then let everybody know that. And then uh, uh, the same thing with hospitals, you know, the same thing with secondary schools, the same thing with primary schools. And then uh, from there, everybody will understand where you're going. Everybody will know that this. And if Nigerians understand you, and all the cars are facing up, and they know you are sincere, and that you love them, and you have them at heart, they will support you. They will support you. And they will support you to fight those who don't want this country to move forward. This is the truth. So you need to be very sincere. Nigerians are good people, you know. Uh, even though there is very low confidence in leadership now, but all leaders are not thieves, and all thieves are not leaders. The moment you start working, there are a number of the governors that are doing extremely very well. You know, I'm not saying any is doing badly, but I can say that the society, you know, has confidence in a number of governors, you know, in a number of, uh, in our president, Mr. President. It's not everybody that we have confidence in the president or in the governors. But those who are very close to these governors or the president, we'll be able to evaluate them. Because the most important thing is the integrity of the heart. You know, what comes down is cannot be your making a loan. It can't be your making a loan. If you're going down now and you destroy some of the air conditioners intentionally and I'm passing through another side and I fail to see it, Anybody that comes, we say, ah, Governor Mai doesn't uh, maintain his facilities. But you did it, and I didn't know about it. So it's not about leadership alone. The lead, you know, must also uh, 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 turn a new leaf. Your Excellency, we would like to get to know you as a person. And my followers and the world will like to know what you enjoy reading. Great leaders are great readers. A lot of times in the United States, we follow what our presidents are reading. So can you tell me some of the things that you enjoy reading as a person? The Bible or the Quran that are complete, you know, uh, that are the biggest books you can ever think of. You know, I love reading the Bible. I love reading the character of God. And... Uh, when you read the Bible deeply, you find out that God is very complex. And sometimes, as a human being, you think that, ah, this is this what God has done here is not right. But it truly remains, who is the epitome of what is right and wrong? It is he that gives it the heart. The, you must know that the man that kills, his heart, you know, his mind has been blinded, so he doesn't see anything wrong with killing. So for him, it is right. So we, 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 I have studied so much about uh, God. There was a time that, you know, the children of Israel offended God, you know, through their king. And the God said, he called a meeting in heaven and said, who will go and they, they, they confuse the prophets? Because the prophets, they were to go for a war. And all the prophets, you know, uh, um, were telling, okay, all the prophets were assembled to uh, advise the king. And God said, who will go and they put a lying spirit to these prophets so that they will wrongly advise the king. And uh, a spirit came and said, I will go and I will be a lying spirit, a false spirit, and uh, I will enter into all the prophets. So he now went and entered into all the prophets. And uh, he told the, prof the prophets now, professor, I said to the king, go to that war. You will overcome. You will surely destroy the Amorites. And so, but one prophet was outstanding. He, he didn't, the uh, first spirit did not enter. He wasn't there. So he came and he told the king, if you go to this war, you will be utterly destroyed. You will not come back alive. And the king was very angry. And he stretched forth his hand 
to say they should seize him. And his hands stayed the same way. And the king cried out and begged the prophet. So the prophet prayed and did not. So he still went and they bound the, the prophet. And they killed him. And the other prophets were very furious. He said, so you mean that I'm lying? I'm a lying spirit? You know. <coughs> so you become very confused. You know. Uh, about whom God is really. So the best is to follow God. You know. Based on whom he is. And not to deep dig deeper to know whom God is. God is very complex. You know, God is very, very complex. You may not believe that God was angry with David for taking the wife of uh, Uriah by sending him to the war front to be killed. And uh, the product of that, you know, this thing, God said the child must die. David begged and the child died. But would you believe that David married the woman and it is from Solomon that the king, the kingship of Israel was instituted. You wouldn't believe that is, you know, the, the, the son of the same woman, you know, and uh, whom God gave all the wisdom. So the Bible is very complete and very complex. So I read the Bible so much, you know, I read the Quran too. And if you read the Quran, you find out that the Quran is almost exactly the Old Testament. The Old Testament. And I have a word to tell the religious leaders in this country. Leave the Muslims alone. Leave the Christians alone. They are all serving the same God. Let God judge, you know, who is serving him better. It is not for man to, to judge. You have no right to condemn another person's religion. You didn't create the person. The Bible says that it's nothing with God to save whether there are a thousand people or one person. God's hands are not short, so you can't fight for God. So nobody fights for God. You know. The same God that gives bread to the Muslim, give bread to the Christians. So let God decide by himself. I know that very good Muslim, very good Christians, very bad Muslim, very bad Christians. Because we've used religion, you know, to hold down the people, to deceive the people. I've been in Saudi Arabia. The extreme religion we practice is not practiced there. In Rome, it's not the same. But yet, with all this religion, the corruption is still very heavy. Insecurity is very heavy. Just one more question. What word of wisdom would you leave for people that are listening to you right now? Uh, you know, the, the saying says that uh, money is a defense, wisdom is a defense, but it says in all you're getting, get wisdom. And I was asked, what is the difference between knowledge and wisdom? He said that knowledge, wisdom is the right application of knowledge. So the worst of wisdom is to listen to God, to obey God, to love God, to love the people. And God will give you wisdom. You know, the, what is the basis of the blessings of Solomon? It was his love for God. David made so much mistakes. You know, sometimes my wife says I'm David. Because I make mistakes, but my heart is totally unto God. And when you love God, He will forgive your mistakes, you know, and then we be with you. So I think that in getting, you know, wisdom is to love God and to love the people. And God will give you wisdom. Solomon showed so much love by killing thousands of. Uh, you know, oxen and cattle and the lambs, you know, which nobody ever did. And God was moved. God is always moved by our faith. You know. And so, knowledge is there, but wisdom comes from God. You know, because it's God that will let you apply the knowledge, you know. Knowledge is, is an attribute. You know, it's a gift. But wisdom is an, you know, the inspiration of God. 
you know. It's like, uh, you know, uh, discerning spirit, you know, because it enables you to know in every situation, what do I do? And that by listening to God. When you love God, then the spirit of God will be alive in you. Everybody has the spirit of God, but some people silence the spirit of God. That's why the Bible says, quench not the spirit. You know. So when you have the spirit of God, you have wisdom. You know, because it was God that gave Solomon wisdom. So wisdom comes from God. Knowledge is a gift. And there you have it. A distinguished Nigerian with positive actions doing extraordinary things. In the next episode, we will look at some of the actions and projects of His Excellency Engineer Dr. David Omai, the Executive Governor of Ebony State. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time, keep activating Africa. More actions, less lag.